Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at a couple interesting recent articles on motor learning. How much variability should we be adding to practice and when? Are skills strengthened when they are reconsolidated when performing slight variations? Does sitting in chest deep water improve skill acquisition? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I'll look at a couple interesting, hot-off-the-press articles on motor learning. First up, a look at variability of practice and reconsolidation. Over the past few months on the podcast, I've been emphasizing the importance of variability in skill acquisition. Performing in the complex environments of sport require adaptable, functionally variable movement solutions. Bernstein's repetition without repetition. And presumably, such variable solutions are best developed by including variability in practice. If you buy all that, then there are a couple of important questions that need to be addressed first in order to effectively implement practice variability on the field. How much variability and when? In a very interesting recent study published in Current Biology, Wims, Bastian, and Selnick provided some answers to both of these questions. They hypothesized that the most effective time to introduce variability in practice was after a motor skill has been consolidated. As I discussed back in episode 19, when we reactivate a previously consolidated skill, it seems to go through a process of reconsolidation and restabilization, where it can be perturbed. As the authors of this paper point out, previous studies have taken advantage of this period to attempt to weaken the previously learned skill. For example, when a new, very similar task is introduced in this period, it can cause interference, weakening the learning of the original skill. Similarly, when TMS is applied over the primary motor cortex during this period, it can prevent the offline improvements in the skill that normally occur when the TMS is not present. But can this period be exploited to improve the originally learned skill? To address this question, Wims and colleagues examined whether adding variability to practice during this reconsolidation period would strengthen learning of the original skill. 86 participants were asked to perform a sequential pinch task, which involves controlling a cursor to generate a specific amount of force in response to visual targets. This was performed over two days of practice. The experimental task was as follows. All participants performed the same sequence during session one, which consisted of four blocks of 30 trials. They then returned six hours later, so after consolidation had time to occur, and were asked to briefly perform the same sequence again. They were then split into three different training groups. Group 1 practiced the same sequence for another four blocks of 30 trials, while Group 2 was a control group that did no additional practice. Group 3 is where it gets interesting. This group practiced the same sequence for another four blocks of 30 trials, with one twist, however. Small variations in the mapping between the cursor on the screen and the force generated were introduced. So in other words, participants could not produce the same amount of force using the same movement any longer. After this training period, all three groups were tested in the original condition again. So same sequence, no fluctuations in the mapping. This took place 24 hours after the first session. As a rough analogy for group 3, imagine learning to kick 25-yard field goals from the center hash with no wind, then practicing kicking them under conditions in which the wind speed and direction are slightly different on every kick, then being tested on kicking in no wind again. Would the practice in the windy conditions help you when there is no wind? So far we've seen how the when question has been addressed in this study. The variability in mapping was introduced after the original skill had time to consolidate. But what about the question of how much? This was another really nice part of the design. The size of the fluctuations in the mapping of force was derived from the normal range of variability that occurs when practicing the task under conditions with no fluctuation. So, returning to my field goal kicking example again, imagine that when kicking under no wind conditions, The final position of kicks varies between just inside the left upright to just inside the right upright. If we wanted to recreate the study, we would introduce wind forces 
for which the strongest force pushed a kick that was headed straight down the middle to just inside the left or right upright. So in other words, this artificial or sometimes called external variability in conditions we are introducing matches the natural amount of variability inherent or internal to the movement itself. For the authors of this study, this choice was important because it makes the manipulation arguably different than the traditional contextual interference studies in which block practice is used. Because the sequence performed was the same and the variability was relatively low, the authors argued that there was no change in the context, like would occur if participants were asked to perform a very different task like a different sequence. This was supported by the fact that none of the participants in group 3 were aware that the fluctuations were actually present. Okay, so what was found? The main question of interest was, of course, how much did each group improve on the original skill, performed in the no fluctuation conditions, which was quantified by looking at the speed accuracy trade-off in the task. As predicted, there was a greater amount of improvement in performance for the group that practiced in the variable mapping conditions as compared to the other two groups. Importantly, there was no significant difference in the improvement in performance between the group that kept practicing the original task with no variability and the group that did no practice at all. This latter effect suggests that additional repetitive practice of exactly the same task after a consolidated skill is reactivated has no real value as it is no better than doing no practice at all. It is practicing the task with some variability introduced at this stage that enhances learning. Another really solid aspect of this study is that the authors collected additional control data to attempt to understand how variability influenced learning. Does it matter when the variability is introduced? To address this, the authors collected data for a group that practiced under conditions of variability and mapping first before the skill was ever consolidated. The improvement in performance for this group was significantly lower than for the group that learned in no variability conditions first and then the variability was introduced. This suggests that the effect requires consolidation first. Another thing the authors examined was when the benefits of variability first appeared. To do this, they looked at performance in the variable mapping condition 30 minutes after it was introduced as compared to the next day. For the former, no benefits were observed, suggesting that the benefits of variability take time because they're presumably strengthening the skill through a process of reconsolidation. Finally, the authors looked at the data on an individual participant level. In doing this, they found that it was those participants that could handle the large fluctuations the best that showed the greatest improvement in learning for the original task. So in other words, it's not mere exposure to variability in practice conditions that improves performance, but rather the ability to effectively adapt to them. So overall, I think this is a really well done study with a lot of important implications, but also some things we must be careful about in terms of interpretation. For the implications, this study nicely shows that unlike what we used to believe, a previously well-learned consolidated motor skill can be altered through a process of reconsolidation but it is not changed by pure repetition of the original skill. Strengthening depends on the introduction of some variability in how the skill was produced. We also clearly see here some important implications for how and when to introduce this variability. For this particular type of skill, more on that in a second, it needs to be introduced after the basic skill has been consolidated after practice in low variability conditions. And it seems like it's best when the variability is not too large and is within the inherent range of the movement itself. So definitely some nice work showing the benefits of variability, which I hope the authors continue to expand on. The one caveat I will emphasize is related to the finding that consolidation in low variability conditions has to occur first. On the surface, this sounds like it supports the use of repetitive drills for new learners. However, it's important to note that there is essentially no redundancy available or required for the task used in this study. The same amount of cursor movement will produce the same pinch force in the basic skill. This will not be true for most of the actions we perform in sports. Returning to my field goal kicking example, is there any benefit in spending hours and hours learning how to kick a 25-yard field goal from the middle of the field in perfect windless conditions? No, because in competition, this perfect scenario will not always be met. Kicks need to be made from different positions, different surfaces, winds, weather, etc. 
So in other words, unlike the pinch task used in the study, most sports skills, like field goal kicking, require variability in movement and taking advantage of motor redundancy in order to be successful. For such tasks, I would argue that the value of this initial consolidation process under zero variability conditions is questionable. And instead, we might want to be introducing some degree of variability right away. That way, in theory at least, adaptability to varying conditions is part of what gets consolidated in the first place. But either way, this study shows that even for skills which we think require a low amount of movement variability in competition, there is still benefits to introducing it in practice. As the authors of this paper nicely put it, quote, Although motor learning is commonly described as a reduction of variability, it's clear that both internal and external variability sources enhance learning. Akin to theories of reinforcement learning, where several action alternatives are sampled prior to arriving at the best solution, the increased variability of the motor command needed to control the cursor led participants to a renewed exploration of potential action alternatives. Thus, participants strengthen skill through the re-exploration of sensory motor space. End quote. Turning to the second study, I was recently alerted to a set of studies that seemed to be presenting some really curious findings. Specifically, that being immersed chest-deep in water seems to aid learning in perceptual cognitive tasks. Some of these effects seem completely reasonable. For example, gait training in chest-deep thermoneutral water significantly improves measures of gait and mobility in patients with arthritis. Presumably, the water is helping with the movement somehow. But there are also some much less intuitive findings. For example, it's also been shown that healthy, younger, and older adults tend to make fewer errors on an auditory memory task when immersed in chest-deep water than on land during both single and dual-task conditions. Collectively, these studies seem to indicate that the aquatic environment may augment cognitive and motor processes. So what is going on here? In a recent study published in PLUS One, Bressel and colleagues compared the speed and accuracy of learning by evaluating a mirror drawing skill performed on land and in chest deep water. This task requires a person to trace a shape and stay within a boundary while observing an averted reflection of their hand through a mirror. It's particularly interesting because research has shown that it's learned implicitly rather than explicitly. The most extreme example of this being with the amnesic patient HM, who showed day-to-day improvements in the speed and accuracy in mirror drawing, despite claiming every day that he'd never tried it before. It was predicted in this study that the time course of the rate of learning would be faster with fewer errors in the water than on the land. In this study, they also assessed verbal memory recall, in other words, explicit memory, and grip strength, to better understand how the environment more generally affected cognitive and motor function. 64 healthy participants between the ages of 18 to 40 were split evenly into water and land practice groups. Participants in each group attended two training sessions separated by 24 hours. The duration of each session was about 30 minutes. The water temperature was 30 degrees Celsius, which is called thermoneutral because it does not cause a change in the skin temperature. On each day of training, participants were asked to complete two blocks of four trials each of the mirror drawing task. After the completion of the second block of training, on the first day, participants were asked to memorize a list of 12 words for the explicit memory test. Finally, grip strength was measured using a hand dynamometer. What was found? In the explicit recall task, there was a 7% increase in the number of words recalled in the water as compared to the land. Grip strength values in the water were 16% greater than on land, so it's clear benefits here. For the mirror tracing task, the results are a bit more difficult to interpret. Although the water group did improve in terms of time to completion more during training than the land group, they were also significantly slower at the start of training by about 10 seconds. So they had more room to improve, and there's also potential for a floor effect here. So, it seems like there might be some benefits, at least for explicit memory processes, of water immersion. The mechanisms for the improved explicit memory in water are unknown, but it may be related to change in parasympathetic drive or greater cerebral blood flow. Whether this curious effect influences motor learning and has any relevance to sports training still remains to be seen. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWaze. 
To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah,